Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, diving, uh, which is really the art and science of, of putting a person underwater to live and to work and, and oftentimes to play. Now, that's something that's gone largely unchanged for the last half a century or more, and, and largely because we have, um, we have this, this idea of, of, of limitations with the human body and with physiology. What I'm proposing today is that we can see past that um, in a very big way and start to make progress in kind of rejuvenating um, steps towards a renewed life in the sea, so to speak. I had my inspirational moment in ocean exploration on, on May 28th, 2002, and it may as well have been yesterday. Um, I had just graduated college, and uh, you know, I, well, I very much valued my degree in marine biology. I wasn't all that challenged. I finished a four-year program in three years. I didn't drop out. I finished ahead of time just to get it over with. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, I, I, had, I actually started to publish peer-reviewed material at that point. I, mean, I, I, was, I was looked at by my advisors as somebody that really had some promise in academia. And I said, well, that's, that's great. Um, but on May 28, 2002, I did this dive to 300 feet uh, with my advisor, and in, uh, uh, it was an incredibly stressful time, right? Because when you're, when you're diving at these depths, you're consuming tremendous amounts of breathing gas, right? So you're under, you're under a lot of stress. But in an eight minute period of time in an area uh, about the size of our famous rectangle, right? that's the world's perfect quadrat, right, for all the field people out there, um, we collected what turned out to be a dozen new species of marine sponge, okay? A tremendous amount of biodiversity in a space that big, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, needle, it's a needle in the haystack, really. Um, later studies revealed that half of those specimens provided chemical clues into cabanic cancer and other diseases. So, you know, I said, look at the potential, uh, look at the promise of, of putting people in the ocean to, to explore and to discover and innovate and make, make this process easier and then to share that with the world. I said, what about that ninth minute? What if I was able to reach outside the box for just one minute <clears throat> and really change the world? So, you know, I had an offer to, to pursue a PhD at that point and I said, you know, this isn't about being a scientist that's using diving as a tool anymore. This is about being a, being a diver, right, that is the tool to do the job. So I, I turned down this offer to pursue a PhD, uh, much to my parents' dismay, and I said, I'm chasing the dream and going after this, uh, this ninth minute. And of course, at age 20, that sounds like a good idea. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I started following trends in diving, scientific diving, over about the past decade, and a few things have become incredibly obvious, and I, I anticipate this would happen. This is the adoption of advanced technologies to improve human performance in the ocean. So things like breathing mixed gases and using rebreathers or devices that recycle our gas supplies, techniques in decompression, which allow us to stay down for uh, longer amounts of time. So you know, we're kind of trending uh, towards wanting this. Scientists want to spend more time in the water. It makes perfect sense. Unfortunately, there's two things that are not happening. This is the decline of the remnants of our previous Life in the Sea programs, right? So back in the 60s and 70s, there's this boom to live and work on the seafloor, projects like Sea Lab and Hydro Lab, and today's what's left, the Aquarius program, which is, is in, in, dire, um, in dire shape right now. Um, scientists aren't using that technology. This top-down approach of massive infrastructure uh, that only affords an opportunity to a very small handful of people just doesn't make sense in today's paradigm. We want to be mobile, we want to pick up, travel to a remote part of the world and, and do our work. The other thing that's not happening are many scientific dives below about 190 feet, despite our having the technology in place to do that. So I set out to uh, figure out why, and being the entrepreneur that I am, I said, I, I see these trends starting to move, and at age 23, I thought it was a really great idea uh, to go out and I raised almost a half million dollars in financing in, in a variety of creative ways, uh, and then fell flat on my face. Okay, I failed, big time, and uh, it was scary. And then my girlfriend dumped me, and I was in really big trouble, right? <laughs> so when you're in this kind of predicament, the one thing you do is you leave the country, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I took off to the Bahamas, uh, where the one place where I've been able to find solace in all this, uh, this journey. And I was able to spend a lot of time looking at environments like this. So these are deep vertical walls that you, you start in the shallows, you know, in 60 or 70 feet of water, and they, they drop precipitously down to the abyss, and it's just really dramatic, breathtaking underwater environments. You know, it's really a cross-section through time. I mean, this, this ledge that we see was sculpted when sea level was much lower during the last glacial maximum. I mean, this is there's amazing geology here, let alone the bi biological um, uh, promise that this environment showed back in 2002. So um, spent a year there, ended up coming back to Rhode Island, uh, for a couple of years working again as a diver. And then uh, in 2000, uh, 
2008, I had a ray of hope. Okay, this environment are mesophotic coral ecosystems, depths of say 200 to 500 feet, these middle light environments became an international science priority. Okay, the research community wanted this and I said, I'm in the position to do this. I just dedicated a huge part of my life to put the technology in place, the techniques in place and really uh, you know, re-engineer my psyche to be able to perform in this environment, not just dive to the depths, but get something done, right? So that was, that was exciting. So I, I tried to raise money again, apply for grants. Of course, at this point, I'm kicking myself. I should have stayed in school, right? I need a PhD to, <laughs> to get money out of NSF or somebody like that. Um, needless to say, it didn't work. I sat around until 2010 and said, finally, we're doing it. I, uh, so I pulled together uh, my dive partner and a group of uh, science colleagues across a whole array of uh, disciplines, put together a science strategy and said, what kind of information can we extract from this environment to do some good work? And uh, still, no bites on funding. I said, that's it, I'm going, maxed out all my credit cards yet again. And, uh, and we went to work, I financed an expedition. Fortunately, <clears throat> when we arrived on site, I got an email that night from the Wake Grants Program saying congratulations. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you, Wake Grants Program, for allowing me to breathe uh, that, that particular <laughs> night. So not only did we get that ninth minute and that 10th minute and that 11th minute and the 12th minute, but we were able to spend upwards of 45 minutes of below depths of 250 feet and working to 450 feet over the course of two expeditions. We've done dozens of dives like this. They're incredibly uh, productive and successful. And we've documented things like uh, an amazing amount of new biodiversity, uh, range extensions of known species, uh, coral disease at depths where we didn't expect to see these kinds of diseases, uh, invasive species at depths where we wouldn't expect to see these, these species. So all of this information is slowly trickling through the peer review process now and is being published. Uh, and then we've also found things like new species. I mean, they, you spend enough time doing the work you love, they start naming animals after you, right? So <laughs> um, maybe if I shaved, it'd look a little bit more like me, but uh, any, very exciting nonetheless. Um, so I said, you know, all these great anecdotal kind of discoveries and we're doing great work. Now, why, I expected this kind of mass migration from the shallows in the scientific diving community down to the, de down to the depths and it wasn't happening. I said, why, right? Well, it's because we still have this misperception of diving to a deeper depth and spending a certain amount of time. There's limits there. So rather than do that, let's look at productive time versus unproductive time. This yellow bar represents a time of 42 minutes. As it happens, 42 minutes is the average dive time that any diving scientist spends underwater doing the work. This is a, a micro-sized snapshot of an environment, right? We've got 42 minutes. That's, that's a fact, okay? That's as good as it gets. That's easy to do in the shallows because we can ascend uh, without required decompression. It gets harder as we go down deeper. At 190 feet, for example, if we spend 42 minutes, we incur uh, about four hours of decompression. So we have to make the investment of four hours of idle time, wasted time, to get 42 minutes of work done. Doesn't make sense. As it happens, this 190 foot dive for <coughs> four hours, that maximizes today's off the shelf life support uh, capabilities. So to do much beyond this, we need new technology, right? Makes sense. If we look at doing a 300 foot dive for 42 minutes, we, need, we have 800 minutes of decompression. No scientist in their right mind that <clears throat> invests a tremendous, tremendous amount of time and resources to, to get to a remote location, spend time in the field, um, will spend 800 minutes of their day doing nothing to get 42 minutes of work done. Doesn't make sense. Um, now, when I, when I started plotting my work in this zone to see what's happening, uh, I work in all these outlying areas. I've been willing to accept the challenges and the risks that come with that. But we need to figure out a way to afford science access to that routinely that fits this commodity style approach of picking up and going diving. So to do that, I said, let's remove the diver from the unproductive environment and put him in a productive one. So I've developed what I believe to be a new class of underwater habitats. Talk about data visualization. This is terrible, right? <laughs> <laughs> I def Remember that, that collaborative innovation grant? Like, let's, let's connect, right? Um, so, so, you know, I, I sketched out this idea for an underwater habitat. I pulled together partners in industry and academia, and I said, let's, let's build a bubble. Let's take the diver out of the environment. Um, so it, this needs to be a totally autonomous system. We can pack it up in a suitcase. We can travel. Uh, so this is a little bit better, right? Um, we spent about a year developing this system. It's about a five-foot diameter circle, about five foot tall, some bench seats, some life support integrated. Sounds very simple. We can take this in the field, deploy it in 20 feet of water we need to decompress, and decompress. We deployed this in 2012 thanks to a second grant through the CRE program this time, and we did several dives to 400 feet and decompressed in the habitat, and what do you know? 
I pop up in this thing and I'm talking to my diet partner and I said, this is the first time we're making productive use of unproductive time, right? Look at what else we can do. Now we can, we can have a snack, we can take, <laughs> no seriously, I mean we, we can read a book, we can take a nap, we can sift through the bag of, of goodies that we collected and start processing samples. Um, we, we're taking advantage of unproductive time, that's what it comes down to. The other important thing that came from this is that rather than look at diving as, uh, and limitations in diving as a function of diving to, to, you know, over depth and for amounts of time, I'm looking at diving in terms of accessible ocean space. This box, this is our 42 minute industry standard that we've accepted for the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, the very simple perspective in looking at the ocean. This is what's happened over the last 10 or 12 years, right? These rebreather technologies, mixed gas technologies, give us a slightly broader view of what's going on, um, but don't necessarily give us the depth. This idea of a habitat or setting up these portable outposts all over the continental shelf, which happens to be an area the size of Texas, just off the US alone, this is paradigm changing, right? I and mean, we can leave the beach and spend a day, a week, a month, living and working underwater again, and in a way very different than what we did in the 60s and 70s. This is today, this is happening. What's even more exciting is that the technology to take the next step already exists. All right, this is the, the next generation atmospheric diving system that's been developed over the last decade, really, by Nuco Research. This has far superior capabilities than previous ADS systems, uh, an incredible range of dexterity. Uh, and movement, the ability to, to pick up and actuate tools and, and make informed decisions on site as a thousand foot depth capability, uh, doubles what we can do wet diving right now. And um, <clears throat> the, the project was financed by the JF White Contracting Company and I formed an alliance with JF White over the past year and they, I've been so fortunate to be dubbed the test dummy <laughs> and uh, definitely not the, uh, the test pilot test dummy. Um, uh, that will make the first use of this for scientific exploration, right? This gives us a huge amount of access to the, out to the continental shelf and beyond in a manned capacity. I mean, very, very exciting. Um, the, the system's been wet tested by technicians at NUCO. Uh, it's going through pressure testing literally right now, um, like this week. And the first training activities uh, with the suit are going to take place in July. I'm, I'm going to be a part of that. Thereafter, we're proposing a, an ambitious series of expeditions to make use of this technology and really demonstrate what we can do as a human in novel ocean environments for the first time. So we're really gonna leave our shores in an entirely new way, leave these uh, misperceptions and, uh, of, you know, of depth and of time and of human phys physiology behind and, uh, and, and set out on what it really is a new era in human ocean exploration. And uh, you know, that future literally starts today, so thank you. Thank <laughs> you.